The music isn't the thing anymore. You are. You're the thing. Building a small fire, you're getting things going. You're finding a couple things that work really well, and you're pouring gasoline on it. Marketing is that gasoline. Too many people are like waiting for that external confidence. Like they're waiting for their friends and family and strangers on the internet to be like, buddy, you're you're dope before they believe it. It's easier than ever to hit those six figures because you can build a business with uh, virtually zero overhead. And I think people miss that fact. <laughs> Hey, welcome to Progression, Success in the Music Industry. In today's episode, I sit down with artist manager, educator, and entrepreneur Evan Price. He and his team at Artist Collective are on a mission to transform artists into what they call artistpreneurs and to help them build a profitable business around their creative passions. Prior to founding Artist Collective, Evan wore countless hats in the music industry from musician to promoter to manager. So we've got insights for everybody in this one. We covered everything from the four elements needed to scale a creative business to why your new song might not be the best offer for your audience. We also got into ways that producers and engineers can diversify and stabilize their income, the importance of prioritizing and understanding your time Time, why you need to identify your super fans, and how to frame the story of the artist and music to better connect with people. Coming at you right now. Welcome to the show, Evan Price, man. How are you doing? Pretty good, man. How are you? Um, I'm good. I'm good. Where, where are you at? I don't, I don't know where you're located. Um, I am based out of Chicago. Got a team member here, a couple of team members throughout the world, basically. We're all over awesome. the place. That's cool. I, I, Went to Chicago for a weekend. I had a really, had a good time. I, I really like that city. It's like got, it's kind of chill, but it's got all the city stuff that I like about like New York. I, I don't know. I could, I dig it. Minus the winners, of course. It's a clean New York <laughs> and not as big. <laughs> That's how I describe it. <laughs> I, I would agree yeah, with fun. that. I, from, from my experience, I would agree with it. Um, so there's a term that the artist collective seems to use in their messaging that I really love. And I wonder if you could just run down that term for us and it's artistpreneur and it's kind of the, the thing that sucked me in when uh, we first connected i was like that word i want to talk about that word <laughs> yeah of course um yeah so an artistpreneur to me is a creative business owner um somebody who has a creative skill set maybe stuck in that starving artist mentality and wants to desperately make it a business maybe they already are um the uh, word kind of came up because i felt like that's what i was i was an artist i'm a creative but I also love building businesses and like thinking about sa sales and things like that. So bringing those two sides of the brain together is kind of where artistpreneur came from. Nice. That's amazing. All right, cool. So before we get into all the good stuff, and I got a huge list of stuff I want to ask you, let's talk about your, uh, how you got into music. What's your music origin story? Were you a musician? What, how, how'd you get in here? The origin story. I never, I've never had it uh, described like that before. I like that. <laughs> um, so I started as a drummer. Uh, I, I started picking up the drumsticks at like fifth grade and then eventually made my way to the drum set, found a bunch of friends that wanted to make some music in a garage. Um, you know, very common story. And then I just kind of wanted to make music with them and do the thing, right? Make, make the recordings and play the shows and get the girls, whatever. At 14 <laughs> years old, that's kind of what I was, what I was into. That's where the head's um, at. But slow, yeah, absolutely. But slowly it was like, started to be like, cool, like, let's really do this. Like it, there, I remember a transition of it being like going from just straight passion into, oh, this could like go to something. Let's like give it a shot. So then I kind of put on the manager hat just naturally. Honestly, I just became the booking agent, the manager, the the babysitter, um, the guy who built the MySpace page, things like that. So as I dipped my toe in there, I was like, I dig this. I think I dig this more than playing music, to be honest. Um, so I started to gravitate towards the business side of things and became that artistpreneur, ah, full circle, huh? <laughs> so, um, yeah, for me, I just started as a, started as a humble drummer and now I'm helping artists do the same thing. That's cool. I feel like, um, every project that kind of does well or, you know, lasts a long time has somebody in the band that gets into the business. You know what I mean? Because if you don't, you just to, everybody's yeah. making music and they're just throwing it at the wall and nothing's happening. So how did the artist collective come about then? It, obviously, you were inspired by this stuff. How did how did you start this new business? 
Yeah, so I decided to go to college um, for music business. Still wasn't really sure what that meant. You know, my background uh, up until that point was just like promoting local shows and like an all ages punk club for 100 people. I, I thought I was I thought I was the shit. You know what I mean? I was like, this is great. But I was like, how do I really make a career out of that? So I went to school to learn more, um, went to Columbia here in Chicago, got a bachelor's degree in music business management, and then realized I don't really want to work for a label that those labels were crumbling at the mo at, at that time. Um, I, there wasn't really a lot of opportunities for um, people to like be, be interns in Chicago. So I just gravitated more towards the entrepreneurial side of thing. I did get a internship um, which was a big inspiration for me. So shout out him. I did get an internship like my first year there with a blues artist here in town That's who cool. built his own record label, publishing company, booking agency. It was literally just him. And I like became his right hand man. I started as the intern and then I ended up booking him shows all around the world, um, getting in place with like the Chicago Bears. And I was like, OK, I like this. I think I liked the. um how small the company was like I felt like I was actually making a change instead of being just a cog in the wheel of a big label where I'm just getting people coffees and stuff so I felt like I was making a difference um so I think that's what yeah. what bit me in terms of entrepreneurial stuff that's awesome get yeah, random random question I mean obviously the music business is very specific entertainment you know business and laws has all their ins and outs if you want to be in music, do you think, well, this is kind of a stupid question now that I phrase it that way, do you think a specific music business degree outweighs just a general business degree? Or do you think if you have a general business degree, you can learn the things you need? I guess it depends on sense? what you're trying to do with that degree. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, what, you're, what are you trying to yeah. do, with, do with it? For me, it didn't really do much for me because I just ended up working for myself. I haven't showed anyone my <laughs> resume since I graduated, let alone my degree. Um, but the music business is if I found myself like working for a record label or like becoming an actual like artist manager, like I thought I was going to at first, the music business degree absolutely helps because, you know, you yeah. know, you figure out what copyright means, how money actually moves through music, which most artists don't even realize that um, what that entails. So <clears throat> when I was looking for colleges, most places at the time back in 2010 or something, most colleges were like, well, I've got a, a business department and I've got a music department. So you could just take both of those classes. I'm like, no, hard pass. That's not the same. Yeah. So, yeah, I think if you're really trying to be in the industry, learning the actual music business as opposed to just a business degree is definitely what you want to go for. Yeah, I went to uh, Berkeley College of Music, not for music business, but they had a music business program. And I always thought to myself, I was like, is this is this better? Obviously, it's targeted, but I kind of have, as I get older, have taken the approach of, um, if you understand marketing and business, you can kind of do whatever you want. <laughs> like, I almost wish, I feel like mm -hmm. everybody should just go to like marketing or business school and then whatever you want to do when you finish is, uh, that's up to you. But those are the things that you need to like really make a place for yourself in this world more than anything, I think. I'd even add a third one on there, marketing, business, and psychology. I think mm -hmm. understanding how people work with which in the marketing degree, they do teach that. But if you can really understand how humans work, that's how they purchase things. You're selling emotions, yeah. not things. And that's all psychology. So if you if you got those three things under your belt, those three skills, you're you're a force to be reckoned with. Yeah, I, that's good. I mean, I, I think about like, you know, psychology of like a session, you know, dealing with the emotions in a room and and all that. So, yeah, I would have I would have benefited from a little bit more psychology as well. But anyway, let's get into your specialty, which is helping musicians like understand business and build the career that they want, which is very in line with a lot of the things that, you know, I, I want to preach on this show. And uh, normally I get like talking points and stuff for prep from people and I just kind of ignore them because it's kind of pointless. But uh, there was one that stuck out to me that that you sent over and it's the four elements needed to scale a creative business. And I was like, shit, I love that. I want to get into that. Can we chat about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So can we start by breaking down what you think those four elements are? Because I'm curious to know whether, you know, I have thought of these things or if I agree or, or whatnot. Yeah, absolutely. I think the four elements of any creative business, any business in general, is going to be an offer, uh, lead generation, sales, and marketing. 
if you can master these four things and really put the blinders on on everything else, it's going to help you. Like, let's even dissect um, just a straight up musician. You know, you're a you're a three piece indie rock band, for instance, and you're trying to make a name for yourself. Figure yeah. out what that offer is. Yes, all of the all of the music gurus are telling you to like there's licensing and there's there's, you know, selling music and there's still selling CDs and T-shirts. There's all that stuff. And that's great. But find what that one offer is for your band that makes you stand out. Maybe it's your badass performance. Cool. Package that into something and sell that. And the rest is just the cherry on top. You're going to sell T-shirts there. You're going to sell all this other stuff. Uh, that's just a random example. So really getting clear on like what the thing is that you're really trying to sell. Um, because I hate to tell you nowadays, it's not just the music. The music is almost secondary to the brand. And as cringy that is, th that might be to some listeners and some producers and stuff. The, the music just kind of sets the vibe for the brand itself. So you're selling the brand. So what's that offer that you're actually pushing is the first one. I love that. I, I totally agree with that. What's number two? Number two would be lead generation. You can't get sales. Well, I'll just blanket. I'll just have a blanket statement and say sales. Can't get any sales without any leads. Whether those leads are like people hiring you for a private party or people hiring you to buy a beat or people hiring you to help you show them how to start writing songs. Like you, you need leads some way. The best, most freest way is social media, right? How are you going to attract people to you, to your offer that you figured out first through the means that you have? Maybe you have zero dollars. Great. Sign up for Instagram. It's free, right? Attract your people to you that way and have a plan in place to hit them up and message them. Like too many creatives just want people to like come to their shop and like figure it all out and press the buy button. People need handheld a little bit. So have a strategy in place to bring leads to you and also talk to those leads. Yeah, community is really big. You just ha you, you have to, the more you can engage with potential clients or fans, you know, I've, at least I've learned from the podcast, the, the more communication, the more engagement I have, and I end up having long conversations with a lot of these people. And then you, you kind of, you understand more about what you should be giving people too as well. Because you, without like looking from the outside in, what you think you're selling is completely, you know, maybe wrong compared to what everybody else is buying. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. And it kind of goes back to that psychology piece too. Like you said, like understanding what they really want. What are they feeling before they even buy the thing from you? Whether it's a live show or a t-shirt or like what, what, what is the, what is the mindset behind the purchase? Understanding that. You're going to know a lot about that when you actually talk to your audience. True, true. And then your last two are sales and marketing. Those those feel very together to me. Um, how, how do you how do you break those up and describe those for my audience? Yeah, sales and marketing are often put together, but I do see them as different. Um, marketing is getting, you know, you're building a fire with your lead gen um, strategy, building a small fire. You're getting things going. You're finding a couple things that work really well and you're pouring gasoline on it. Marketing is that gasoline. So too many people kind of jump to that when they don't really know what's working, they end up wasting a bunch of money. So right. I think that's a big piece. I skipped ahead a little bit. The third one would be sales. How are you going to sell this? Is it a discovery call with them one-on-one? -on -one? Is it a link on your website? Is it um, through email format? Are you hitting them up individually on SMS? Like, what does the sales process look like? Um, and for me and my clients, I really push high ticket offers mm. instead of starting with your $20 shirt and your 99 cent download, like what can you package that's higher ticket that'll give you a little bit more to live on? Maybe it's a private party for $3,000. Uh, got a lot of clients doing custom songs for people for like weddings and stuff. They're paying like five grand. Cool. You can eat on that. Like I said, everything else is a cherry on top. So figuring out how huh. you're going to sell. And I think this is a big piece for creatives. They're just a little uncomfortable selling because it's like their baby. It's their thing. It's a creative flow. Like, how do you sell that? So it's a skill like yeah. anything else you can learn. Well, OK, so maybe this question tar makes me your target audience. But if I think if I'm a musician, which I mean, I don't really release music. 
So I'm not, but you say lead and I say, what's a lead for my music? Like I put my record out, where, where does lead play in for musicians? Lead would be a fan, right? Cool, you got somebody listening. Maybe they subscribe. I'm just trying to give random examples. They subscribe to your Patreon, right? right? Mm. Even if they follow you on Instagram, that's a lead. They have raised their hand in some format and said, I like what you got going on. Tell me more. Jump in. Don't be afraid to slide in the DMs and say, hey, what's it, how's it going? Thanks for the follow. I see that you're here. Like, people miss that part. Like, there's no purchase without a person on the other end. And you need to connect with a person before they actually purchase. So it goes a long way to just message anybody who comments or follows you and says, hey, what's going on? Have a conversation. And then that's a lead to me. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's a, see, I've never connected those two things like that. You know, for, say, a mixer or an engineer, that makes a lot of sense. You, you have leads, and then you can close a deal. If you're releasing music, I've never, I've never connected those dots. And if, if you are listening right now and you have never connected those dots, make sure you go back 30 seconds and, and connect them because that's kind of the secret. You're totally right. The leads are these people that follow you. You're reminding them that you're putting music out. They're going to find it. They're considering the Patreon, they're going to the show. Uh, yeah, it, it's a, that's a good connection that I had never made. So it's all like that. I like that. I wanted to go back to the offer, if you don't mind, because it actually tags a couple of questions that I had written out. How does one maybe identify what their offer is? Like I mentioned earlier, like without, you know, the outside perspective, it can be hard to see what your strength is. Um, any tips for identifying what your offer might be as an artist? Yeah. As an, as an actual artist. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the the good go-to, the like lowest hanging fruit is probably a live performance. Some kind of live performance um, just as an artist. But I also have artists that I've worked with that do other things too. Like they're, of course, doing the typical performing and recording and all that stuff. But they also are really good at teaching guitar. So they sell that as an offer to their existing fans or some other people to show them how to start writing songs or playing the guitar or whatnot. So it's really just um, focusing on a, a, what I call your MCS, your monetizable creative skill set. What's the one thing you're an expert in? Like, are you just like the best vocal mixer that you know? Like, are you a cool, are you a tech guy that you could like help people build marketing funnels? Like, what are some other creative skills that you have? Like, everybody's more than just like a drummer or a producer. They do other stuff. So what the cool thing is, about artistry now is it's about that brand. No, you know, you don't have to just be a cookie cutter. Like I'm just a recording artist. No, you can be a bunch of different things. It's just about tapping into those things you're already doing and building the offer around that. That's great. That, that is true. The, the, I think the, the most important thing for it, anybody in this industry is brand and authenticity. And it basically what you're speaking to is if you understand who you are and what your skills are, you can then brand that in a way where you're like, hey, these are the things that I love doing. These are the things I excel at. Let's do them together. So I think, uh, I think that's great. Mm -hmm. Love that. That's awesome. I gl I'm glad we got to, we got to break that down. Uh, I'll, let me hit some of these other random questions for you. I like to get into learning from mistakes a lot. So are there any top mm -hmm. mindsets that you think creatives have that are stopping them from building a successful business or career? Tons. <laughs> um, <laughs> top two, um, self-doubt and distractions. Mm. The, let's skip to the second one. Distractions. The I'm too busy. I'm too overwhelmed should be changed to, I'm just not prioritizing this right now. You're not, you have the same 24 hours as everybody else as Beyonce as me as Connie, like whoever, like everybody has the same time. What you're doing is you're not prioritizing it. And that's okay. That's not like a, it's not like a burn. It's just realizing that and like understanding that it's really not about like a time constraint. It's just about a focus. Um, and that overwhelm with time comes with taking on too many things. Like in order to say yes to what you need to, you have to say no to what you don't need anymore. And that's tough for people, especially creatives. They have all these ideas or shiny, shiny objects. I want to do this project. I want to do that project. If you put your energy into all those things, none of those are likely going to take off. Um, 
the mindset or the like phrase I hear a lot is just like, yeah, just like waiting for one of those things to take off. But hear me out. What if you just focused on one and went from there? Um, our motto in our um, accelerator program is do less better. It's good. I want to take away things from you. I don't want to give you more stuff to do. Pile it on. The first course of action is saying, cool, what, what are some things we can take away? What are some things we can stop doing? Do you need to really release that right now if you're building this other thing? Do you really need to focus on this project? So um, taking away that overwhelm is going to help you. Yes, that is huge. That's like, uh, I don't know if you've listened to my podcast before, but that comes up on so, so much, prioritizing it. And a phrase that really kind of changed my life is every time you say yes to something, think about what you're saying no to, which you basically just touched on. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, that's just huge. Prioritizing and understanding like where you're focusing your energy is like the most important thing you could do if you're trying to build something that's going to last in the long term. If you're just like doing gigs and cash and checks and not worried about like creating this like long arcing thing, then you're fine. Fine. But yeah, mm -hmm. understanding where you're spending your time is huge. Yeah, I mean, just a simple exercise, just a simple exercise to kind of manage your time, just write out what your what your habits are every day. I think you'd be surprised. Most people don't do a time audit, as I call it. What are you what are you yeah. actually spending every single moment on? I think you find that it's not on stuff you really want to. And that's where your I'm too busy comes into play. Um, so take, taking an audit of your time, I definitely recommend because then you'll see a lot of a lot of improvements that could be could be made well let me uh let me pose a question as somebody because there's somebody out there thinking this right now that all sounds like a lot of work that doesn't involve me making any money what do you say to that person Th those are probably those are probably the same people that say that meditation is a waste of time <laughs> you know <laughs> i could be doing stuff i don't need to think and breathe <laughs> So I would say that that's not true. You need to take an audit. You need to take a fine tooth comb to everything that you do. And if you are constantly saying, I'm too busy, you are a prime person to take the time to just audit. You don't need to do it every day, but like for a week straight, just write down everything you're doing. I'm taking the trash out. I'm watching Netflix for four hours and then go back and be like, oh, I see the problem. I'm uh, watching Netflix a lot and I barely take the trash out. <laughs> that's good that's good yeah I, I i agree with you i think everybody i track my time with like hashtags and like check on it and see what i'm doing i'm an absolute nerd i like i've taken it too far but um it really <laughs> helps you understand like where you're getting value and how you can like trim things down and uh i think everybody should try it like you said for a week give it a shot for a week um uh, but let's go back to your first mm -hmm. one i think uh you said it was self-doubt right if i remember correctly i yeah. totally agree somebody said this to me once and i think you would resonate with this what if confidence was a choice? What would that look like? And I think that's something that a lot of artists need to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that one. What if confidence was a choice? I like confidence follows action. I like that. I like that too. Too many people are like waiting for that external confidence. Like they're waiting for their friends and family and strangers on the internet to be like, buddy, you're, you're dope before they believe it. And that's just a slippery slope of toxicity there. You need to believe it first, even before everybody else does. Pretty sure Drake even has a, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to quote Drake right now, but I'm pretty sure he has a line that says that. I was the greatest before I even, they even knew I was or something like that. So it's like, that's true. You've got to really believe your skills um, and that you can do this before anybody else tells you, hey, you're doing a great job. Um, so that confidence comes from after you you actually start doing the thing and, and trying things, posting content, sending out emails, whatever that looks like for you. Yeah, no, I, I agree. You can't, uh, you can't wait for validation. And if you never release your music, you're never going to get any validation. So you're, you're fucked, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's transition a little bit. I wanted to do a little bit of like branding promotion type stuff. Uh, where do you think creatives generally fall short when it comes to promoting or branding themselves? Where do they fall short from? Let's talk about promoting first. New new songs out now. Go do it. Stream it. It's a it's a song with with use it with your ears. Nobody's gonna nobody cares about that. There's like I think the new stat is like a hundred thousand songs are released every day now. Like nobody cares about your new thing. 
Tell them why they should care. Show them. Let them hear it, feel it, like get down to the emotional piece of it. Like, what is your song about? Listen to the song because if you've ever been broken up in a Walmart parking lot, you know, okay, I'm listening. That was actually me. You know, it wasn't me. But things like that, that's how you promote. You promote the story and not like the thing. Mm. Like you look at movie trailers. Movie trailers aren't like, there's a new movie by Liam Neeson now. Go see it. Everybody be like, what? What is it? I don't understand. Like to tell me more. So the promoting aspect, I think, needs to be be reshaped. It should be really story based and like feeling based and less about like that you spend five hours in a recording studio. Like nobody gives a shit. <laughs> that, that, that's awesome. I agree. It, it, when you do put it in perspective like that, where there's a hundred thousand new songs coming out every day, that means that there are a hundred thousand people with a couple people involved in the project <clears throat> all tweeting like check out my new track like that is you're literally screaming into the void <laughs> there's has to be something that makes you want to mm -hmm. be related to that thing so what about the branding side the branding side yeah um i feel like it kind of goes hand in hand as well i think a lot of artists miss the step of making themselves the hero of the story like I'm an artist, I'm cool, I'm doing this cool photo shoot, and you should be like, you should want to be like me. And I think where we're heading towards in, in artistry is more bringing viewers into the story a little bit more, into the brand story, like people need to see themselves. One of my favorite books is <clears throat> Building a Story Brand with um, Donald by Donald Miller. <clears throat> he breaks down the framework of every single movie, TV show, book to ever exist, what that framework is. There's a hero. They experience a problem. They meet a guide who understands their problem, who gives them a plan to go into action, calls them into action, and it ends in a, a comedy or a tragedy. Every single movie follows that. So if artists could tap into that, if they could present themselves and the book talks about how you as a business, as a brand should present yourself as the hero, as the Dumbledore and not the Harry Potter. I think artists are trying to be the Harry Potter and be like, I'm the wizard, right? I, you should be like me. No, mm -hmm. you're telling a story. You should bring them into that as the guide who understands what they're going through. Let's go back to my ridiculous. Hey, I know what, if this is for anybody who's been broken up with in a uh, Walmart parking lot. This is what happened. You're bringing them into that story by being like, oh yeah, that's me too. So if you can tap into frameworks like that and like bring people into um, a situation that they can relate to, that's a powerful brand. That's where powerful brands like Apple and Nike thrive. That's how they yeah. got big. They, they, they weren't selling the products, they were bringing people into their story and they just happened to sell products. Okay, we've kind of, we've touched on branding, promotion, you've said the word socials. I hear a lot of people throwing words like nano-influencer around these days, and a lot of people saying that brands want to work with creators that have smaller, more engaged audiences, which is kind of, you know, we're talking about building a more engaged audience. Um, what's your opinion on that? Is, is that happening if you're a smaller scale artist with like a thousand followers and you don't have, you know, 10, 20,000 monthly listeners on Spotify? Is there a possibility of brand deals for you because of this this outlook on nano influencers? I think, don't quote me, which you're going to okay. because this is recorded. <laughs> but I think micro <laughs> is like ten thousand to fifty thousand, and then I would assume nano is like below that. But I would assume it would need to be over a thousand. Okay. Will brand deals do that? Apps, I th I think so. Depends on the brand. It depends if you connect with their their brand culture uh, to a deep level, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I definitely think that's a possibility. So really, it comes down to understanding your audience, really connecting with your audience, and then if somebody recognizes that that's valuable to them, you've already created that thing. Is basically kind of what you're you're hinting at here. I'll give you an example. I sure. worked with like a grungy rock band from Chicago that played. You could see them playing in like a lot of like motorcycle clubs or like in, in the southern, mo the more southern states, they would just play like a place where like they would be the band in the background of like a Sun's Anarchy like uh, episode. Right. Yeah. So 
there was a disconnect between who they wanted to reach and who they were actually reaching. They wanted, they're like, we just need more college kids to like us. I'm like, but why? College kids have no money. And why are you trying to fit a, you know, round, you know, peg into a square hole? Like, why don't you just use what you have? Like, we looked and like, they even said, they're like, yeah, our super fans are like older, like motorcycle couples. I'm like, dude, use that. (laughs) So once we started to target, actually lean into the target that was existing, they were able to really get more gigs and like pick up more steam because they weren't trying to please everyone. They honed in on what was actually working and grew from there. And that's why I think all the bigger artists, you know, start with as well. They hone in on their specific audience and then it gets mass appeal and it goes out from there. But don't force an audience into your music if it doesn't really make sense. Use what you got. Yeah. I agree. That, that segues into a question that I had, I had for later about uh, Thousand True Fans. You, you're talking about identifying your super fan and, and you know, really targeting those people. I'm assuming that you think the Thousand True Fans philosophy in 2023 is still an excellent way to approach starting, you know, building your career. Yeah, I think it starts with that, that exact thing. Who is, who, who are my super fans? And a lot of times you'll find, not always, a lot of times, they're mirror images of yourself. Cool. You like, you know, you like a lot of 2000s emo music and you make a lot of music like that. That's probably your audience. So find, start there. Find the 1,000 people that, you know, live and breathe just like you do. Find that story that connects you guys because this is all about human connection and grow from there. So again, use what you got. This came to mind. What do you think about putting marketing dollars behind your music? Like, let's say you know that you're targeting your your emo fans. Is what's best use, best ROI on marketing dollars for a smaller artist? Yeah, especially if you're on a budget, don't put it into Spotify. At first, if you're on a limited budget, you are sp- you are spending dollars to get fractions of pennies. That makes no sense. None. If you got money to spend and you're like, yeah, let's do it. I'm in it for the long haul. I've got a million dollars to spend. Cool. Run a couple ads to a playlist that you built or straight to your website or whatever it is. But if you are on a limited budget, like a lot of you are, start with those super fans. What do those super fans really want? Let's go back to the the, um, grunge rock example. Cool. I'm thinking patches. I'm thinking like, what are some merch items that they really like? Again, High ticket offers if you can. It's to me, if you've got a lot of, if you've got a lot of like, you know, um, motorcycle driving, patch wearing people that want like to hire you potentially for a private show, that's your offer. Stick with that. Put money into that. Mar- try to put money into marketing in front of those people and saying, hey, I'm offering a private show for you know two thousand dollars. This is what it entails. It's better use over there when you have a higher ROI than half of a penny that you'll won't see for 10 years my opinion at least no that that actually the artistpreneur thing it is all click for me now because you know because i think about releasing music (laughs) i think like oh i'm gonna release a song i'm gonna put my question was rooted in how do i put my ad dollars behind the song and your answer was rooted in forget that how can you actually make money with your offer like you we started off so yeah if that hasn't clicked with you while you're listening to this uh, i'm just trying to help help connect this because yeah i think a lot of people they think about the roi coming from the thing that they're focusing on whether you're a mix engineer or you're making beats or whatever it is when if you're going to add value maybe maybe make a sample pack if you're a producer is more valuable than trying to sell more beats on Instagram. That's great. I, it, it clicked for me. How much do I owe you? <laughs> this one's on the house, my friend. <laughs> okay, per- perfect, um, perfect. Yeah, I mean, let's even look at, let's say you're just an original band and you want to make some extra money. Why not be a wedding band too? Why not also be a corporate band? There's like corporations that will give you $10,000 because they have, they have to spend their budget for a cool band to come play at their gig at their like Christmas party or something. It definitely happens all the time. Cool. Now you're there and you can connect with a bunch of new fans. You can sell all your other, you know, small items and you, you know, filled up your bag for the night because you just got paid 10 grand. 
Yeah. So it's it's about like focusing in on that offer and the rest is the rest is like cherry on top. Music, you're gonna, you got their emails, you can send them the music. Hey, just, just so you know, I made a playlist of, of all my songs. Check that out too. The, the music isn't the thing anymore. You are. You're the thing that they want. <laughs> Your offer is the thing. The music is just there. You should push it too. Um, but really focusing on that offer, what that is for you, can help you scale. That's true. How, how difficult on a scale of one to 10 do you think it is for people that you're working with or people that are in your accelerator to come to that realization that the offer is you and not their product? Our clients now, I'd, I'd say it's probably close to an eight. A, a lot of them are already kind of on that mindset. They just don't know how to make it happen. Um, I've been in this long enough where I was an artist manager. I was working with artists like they're just like, I want to get my music out there, man. Like I did that for a long time. And it was like more of a, a two. They were just like, but the music is my thing. The music is my product. Yeah. So it really just depends. Um, but for our artistpreneurs, yeah, they're kind of already on that mindset. They're just kind of stuck, um, mm. in how to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, your messaging is very clear. So I, I would imagine your leads are strong. <laughs> <laughs> to go back into the terminology <laughs> that we started that. this off with. Um, awesome. Before, <laughs> I got a couple of questions I end the show with, but before we do that, I wanted to do a question kind of more aimed at the behind the scenes people, you know, producers, engineers, mm -hmm. songwriters, mixers, et cetera, whatever. I feel like the biggest hurdle that a lot of the industry, that part of the industry has to struggle with is they're only making money when they're in the room working or they're waiting for some someday maybe royalties to potentially never show up. What are some things that come to mind to help them diversify, maybe stabilize their income? You seem like a good brainstormer. You want to throw a couple of thoughts out for, for these people? Yeah. Be a master of funnel hacking and building out funnels. That's just the new thing. So um, bring them in what business calls a, a loss leader. Bring them in with a low ticket thing you make no money on to prove your worth. Right. If I was a business, mm. I'd free samples. Right. Hey, try this caramel. Oh, dope. This is good. I'm going to buy a whole pound. That's business. No artists are really doing that. I won't say that. Some artists are doing that. I get hit with a bunch of creatives that are doing that. Um, so producers, here's an example, just to go back to your question. Give out a beat. I know it sounds crazy. Give out some kind of a service that you know you're going to take a hit on mm. to prove that your thing is what that person, that lead wants. Because more often than not, they'd rather just work with you, the one person in front of them that gave them something. Um, that's the, you know, that's the mindset of reciprocity. Oh, you gave me something, so I guess I'll work with you, you know? So try that. And I know that's hard. I was like, what, what's the worst that happens? Like you're, you're just sitting on your hands waiting for business anyway. You might as well get your work out there maybe um, work for free for a few times, just, you know, but you need to set up those funnels to be like, cool, this is the next steps to work together. And then you can be like, great, you got that one thing for free. Now to work with me, this package deal is $1,000. That's, that's a business plan right there. Yeah, no, that, that's great. Um, kind of follow-up question. You mentioned earlier that you, you push a lot of your, your clients and people you're talking to to go for a high value offer. I think a lot of people are afraid to go straight to a high value offer. You know, they want to start low. Let's, let's use mixing, for example. It's, how much do you charge to mix? The very few people straight out of their mouth are going to be like $2,000. Most of them, when they start out, they're going to be like 50 bucks. I'll do it for free. And if you like it, then give me 40. And they just talk themselves down. So um, how do you help people mm -hmm. believe in the high value offer? We dissect the emotions behind the buyer. It's the same branding techniques of, again, I'm going to bring up the same two people or the same two brands, Apple, Nike, Gucci. Their hardware is no different than anybody else's, yet it's three times the amount. BMW isn't selling cars. They're selling luxury, right? They're selling the emotion. So if you can get clear on what that emotion is and you can connect your, your brand messaging behind that and like get in their minds there, you can yeah. value this at, you know, that's why the bigger, you know, the same producer, the producers making the same style of beats are charging $10,000 as opposed to the free YouTube beats. There's not too much different. Uh, don't crucify me here. Not too much different, right? 
but it's about the branding and the messaging and what else you're getting, what other value you're bringing. Track record as well. So, <clears throat> Trust. Mm -hmm. Those are yeah. those are huge. You know. Trust. Yeah, that's awesome. This this has been this is great. I I, I would keep going, but I I have three questions, four questions I have to hit you with at the end. So cool. The first one, this one's kind of just for fun, mostly so I have more music to listen to. Are there any artists that you're really into that you think more people should be listening to? Maybe it's somebody you're working with. Maybe it's just somebody you like listening to. Any music you think people should check out? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, of course, like all kinds of music. I did start in the metal industry, though, and I love me some metalcore. So there's <laughs> a, a um, probably one of my favorite bands is North Lane. They're an Australian metalcore band that I've been obsessed with for years Amazing. so check them out if you like some uh, melodic metalcore link will be in the show notes on that one and then uh so the questions we always we always end the show with uh, this one's a new one you might be the first person to get it so i'm sorry uh and thank you um are there any mistakes <laughs> that you've made over your career that turned into big catalysts for growth for you that you're willing to share mistakes that i made that turn into growth oh gosh yeah probably plenty most of the mistakes I, I like to turn into growth. Um, I think a, a big pivot, and I wouldn't even call it a mistake, is just like that that pitfall of me just like wanting to be in the music industry just because like I thought that's all there was. Like, cool, I just I imagine myself being a manager and like doing this and like doing the typical manager stuff of like doing all of this work for a percentage that never really came for some independent artists, right? Um, <clears throat> some would see that as a mistake, but it helped me grow into this artistpreneur mindset of actually these aren't my people I really want to work with. Uh, the artists are cool and uh, you make amazing things, but I'm a little more, I vibe a little bit more with those on, more entrepreneurial people. So it was like a pivot that I made. It was a mistake that I was just like, ah, this isn't for me, but it turned our, you know, our company into the success that it is now. So very grateful for it. Amazing. Love it. I love it. And then, uh, you know, this might be some, this answer might be slightly related at times, but, uh, next question is, was there a time in your career that you chose to redefine what success meant to you? Yeah. It'd kind of be that same answer. <laughs> yeah. to be honest. Um, as soon as you finished that question, I was like, mm, this is going to be the same answer on this one. <laughs> uh, yeah. <clears throat> Let me try to get, think of a, a new one though for you. Um, a time that I chose to redefine success. Um, that's a good one. Um, I think it was just about less about the money that I was going to to generate, right? Like you, we go into this, like I'm gonna build, I'm gonna build this business and I make millions of dollars, and that's cool. And it was just more into I'm fine with just building the lifestyle that I actually want. So many people just want millions of dollars and to do all these things, but they've never really, again, going back to the auditing thing, I like to audit stuff. <laughs> audit what, what what do you want your lifestyle to be like like have you thought about that like what is your ideal day to day is it that you're just getting up playing music are you traveling are you with family so i think there was a moment in my life where i was just like had to halt and be like what is my end goal here like instead of just being caught in doing the things i was forced to be like what do i want to happen what's the big outcome goal i want and ultimately it's just to make enough money to to be able to travel and to support, you know, my family. That's it. I don't need, I don't need to be a billionaire. It's not going to, I don't know what to, I wouldn't know what to do with that much money. So yeah. It's good. I, I completely agree with you. I just, I feel like uh, work life balance in this industry is just, uh, it's just ignored until it's unfortunately maybe too late for some people. Um, but I, I, can, I, I agree. I, I had this picture of what I thought I would do with my career and my life. And then one day I was like, do I really want to make all these sacrifices when I can continue to be happy by doing these things when I may not ever have mm -hmm. that thing? And I think that, um, yeah, anyway, I, I agree. I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh, it's not all about it. being number one and having a bunch of money. It's like, all right, I love what I do. It's way better, way better. Um, mm -hmm. All right, last question that I hit everybody with is, uh, what is your current biggest goal that you can share with us? And what is the next smallest step you're going to take to go towards that goal? Biggest goal I have right now is I want to help 1000 creatives 
build their own six-figure businesses. And again, not always about the money, but six figures I've found in my years of doing this is typically the, the number that people are like, I'd be comfortable there. I'm good. So that's a big goal for, for myself and my clients. So I'm going to help a thousand people hit that and make a nice living just doing what they love. That's all awesome. simple as that. And the smallest step towards that is just as cliche as it sounds one at a time, right? I'm not in a hurry to hit that, hit that thousand because I want to do it right. So one client at a time, I want to help them enrich their life, give them the tools, give them the frameworks that will help them build a successful business um, from their creative skills. That's awesome. That's awesome. Follow up to that. Do you think in today's like super connected internet world, do you think it is easier, harder, or about the same for a musician to have that like $100,000, six figure, happy, stable life? I think it's easier than ever to hit those six figures um, because you can build a business with uh, virtually zero overhead. And I think people miss that fact. You can build an online business selling your creative skills and n n need nothing more than a computer. Like you don't have to have a, you know, a brick and mortar store. You don't have to have all this inventory and all these employees and interns. You don't need any of that stuff. Get a laptop, get it from Craigslist and start doing your thing. Of course, if you're producing, you might need a couple other things, but it's easier than ever to do it. Um, and I've got a lot of colleagues hitting six, seven, eight figures, and <laughs> they don't even have an office. It's it's crazy. That's amazing. That that's that's the mindset that I think you know a lot of people need to take is you know that you can hit six, seven, eight figures making music and being happy. You know, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Evan, this has been great, man. I really enjoyed hanging. Please share with people where they can find you and find the Artist Collective and and whatever you want. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I appreciate your time too. Um, you can find me on Instagram the most. It's uh, AC underscore Evan. Check out the company at, at Artist Collect um, or artistcollect.com for more information about our program, about the rest of my team. Um, yeah, if you're creative, if you're just like jonesing to like make some money doing what you love and you're just not quite sure how to get started, um, we got free strategy sessions with the team. We can help you brainstorm, see if it's a good fit to work together. So hit us up. That's awesome. That's awesome. I appreciate you coming on. I'm glad we got to connect and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch again. I'm, uh, I hope. Yeah. Thanks, man. Appreciate you.